I think we're going to have to start up again, I'm afraid. So uh, this last segment is going to be about a, uh, what is almost a completely a new paradigm called open design or open source hardware. So first of all, who's heard of the open source movement, as in open source software? Would you like to give me a description of what you think open source is? Open, open source. source software? I think it's uh, <laughs> like freeware you put on the internet if you make something that you think is nice, you put it up and uh, for everyone to use and, and change as they like for, for their own needs. Okay, so freeware. So, But fundamentally it's the fact that they can change it. So the source code, the things beneath it uh, are free and open and accessible. So open design and open hardware is the parallel from open source design but changing it to the tangible domain. So can anyone suggest what might be a description of open hardware, what might be a definition given that it's the parallel of the open source movement but in the tangible domain? I say that's a perfect example, yeah. Um, so we can look at where the open source movement gives out the source code on how the program runs, how it operates, so that people can make uh, modifications to it, make it run slightly differently. We can also have the design blueprints behind a physical or tangible product or hardware, which we can give out. So there's no reason why we can't store some of our CAD files online and allow people to parametrically manipulate them and then print off or create their own versions of the product you designed originally, uh, as long as they're stored in an open design format. So why would we want to develop something in an open design manner? There aren't many examples out there because, as I say, it's quite a new paradigm. Um, but one thing we're noticing, particularly the patent wars that are going on at the moment, um, it seems like lawyers and legal fees are getting funded more than research and development, which is a bit of a travesty. So one reason we might want to go down an open design route is because designers and engineers, people like us who provide value, will get the, the money rather than uh, lawyers and administrators. Um, it's also to a strategy that we believe might help maximize the value of the product to the crowd and allow them to develop derivatives. So where you may develop one product, you may send out to the crowd and all of a sudden you may have masses of variety of the same product. So lots of product variants created by the crowd parametrically manipulating your, your product. Um, and also it's a method to gain visibility and influence. So just like the open source software uh, domain, one of the, the nice things about these projects is very little marketing and advertising has to go in. The word seems to spread quite rapidly and quickly, um, and you also seem to get quite a lot of exposure. And when more and more people are using your, your designs or your software, it means you have more influence. Now the trick is, once you have the influence, how do you extract the value from this system? So you may have given your, your design away to a million people. They may have it. They may be using your system. But how do you then get the value from it? How do you make any money from it? Something that's fundamentally important, I believe, to uh, this movement is the licensing. So how open do you want to be? Now, of course, you can just put your uh, designs online and just let people do what they want with it. Um, but now we have these things called the Creative Commons uh, licenses and we can see most of these slides are based on Creative Commons. Buy is just attribution, meaning you're licensing this out to everyone, they can do whatever they want with it as long as they reference you. So as long as they say the originator of this project was so and so. The one I think is closest to the, or most tied to the open design movement is this uh, attribution and share alike. 
And that means basically I can put a design out there and anyone can take that and anyone can modify it um, and sell it as their own, but they have to reference me. They have to say this was Howard Designs' uh, product originally. The other important thing about this is their derivatives that they produce and pass on and sell on also have to be licensed under the same agreement. So if I produce something under an attribution share alike, somebody else takes it and starts mass producing it and making it, that product that they make also has to be based under this attribution share alike license. Um, so it's kind of perpetuating. Then you also have non-derivatives. This is for mainly for artists who want to protect their work. So imagine you're a, a fantastic artist and you put up a piece of artwork online and you want people to use it and distribute it uh, imagine someone takes hold of it and starts warping the image slightly and then starts distributing and all of a sudden your name is associated with this tarred piece of work which you're not happy with anymore. So in some instances you really do not want people to manipulate it. And if your, your brand name is absolutely essential uh, that there's quality throughout your brand, you might want to have the non-derivatives version. But again, I'd, I'd emphasize the share alike version is most synonymous with open design. Then we also have the non-commercial aspect. So for societal projects or societal entrepreneurial projects, we can produce something on open design that says, you can do whatever you want with this as long as you don't try to make money from it. So it's not for making money. So something open design, and I think to a certain extent, open source software has been thought of. It's an emerging paradigm, uh, but it's essentially a gift to the people and society. So it's put out there for people's competencies and skills to thrive on. Here's a really nice example from the um, Bradener lab. Uh, IP in the pharmaceutical industry is incredibly important. And as a result, drug development can take many, many years. And you can potentially be sat on a life-saving drug for many years before it gets out into the public domain just because you're waiting for patency clearance. Now, the Bradener Lab found this, this really potentially useful molecule and started distributing it. They produced it on a Creative Commons license and gave it out to loads of different pharmaceutical companies. Now, because it had a lot of worth in it, because it showed a lot of potential, all these companies started taking this and adapting the compounds to, to make new cancer-saving drugs. Um, and they were also produced on uh, op uh, Creative Commons share-alike licenses. So therefore, you all of a sudden had lots of uh, drugs on the market with lots of data open. So it really stimulated innovation. So just by somebody, um, a non-profit organization, being able to provide this first step, it really enhanced this field. There's some other very uh, important open source uh, contributors. Uh, Sun Microsystems, for example, uh, produce uh, Eclipse, I think it's called, uh, which is the, the developer's platform. Um, IBM and HP have uh, produced lots of patents which they've put um, out to the community saying they're not gonna protect anymore. And Toyota have a really interesting model where they actually develop and help train up lots of their suppliers. And the interesting thing there is all this knowledge that Toyota have gained goes into their suppliers and their suppliers can then supply other firms and other companies. So they're not holding up um, their knowledge and expertise solely to themselves, but kind of increasing the strength of the market around them. Um, and Eli Lilly, uh, I I showed a little bit earlier, they're very into open innovation. Now, two really important projects in the open uh, design movement are Arduino and RepRap. So, hands up who's heard of Arduino? Okay, great. Um, so, this is, for those of you who haven't, um, this is an open source microcontroller. So, anybody can find out how to make one of these and can produce ones themselves. They can mass produce them and sell them off themselves um, because it's open design and it empowers people. So young entrepreneurs who want to develop and program up their own electronics
could just buy Arduino kits or make them themselves and start programming up their own electronics. Who's heard of the RepRap project? Okay, not quite as many, but a few. This is a uh, open source or open design 3D printer. This is the one that sat on my desk in my office at the moment. Um, and it essentially is a, a printer, but in three dimensions. So it, it prints structures in this type of uh, several different materials. The nice thing about the printer is it's completely open source. So as long as I have a set of parts, I can download the blueprints off the internet, work out how to assemble it, buy some standard components and make one for myself. Then I can download uh, the CAD files for all the uh, rep wrapped parts and print off a set for Jakob. And Jakob can make his own. And then he can download the, the blueprints off the internet and print off a set for all of you guys and you can make your own printers. And for all the components, it essentially works out about uh, under 4,000 crowns to have your own 3D printer. And this will interface with standard CAD packages. So these two are fundamentally important. A, because they're quite successful open design projects. And B, because they empower entrepreneurs and individual inventors. So imagine a situation now in a few years where we all have a 3D printer sat on our desk and we can all download designs from the internet because they're open source. And instead of going to companies, we can just be downloading designs and printing them off for ourselves and making them for ourselves. And we can have Arduino controllers to incorporate electronics into our, uh, into our products as well. So these are real open source enablers. Thingiverse is a, a platform that also is very important and enables the open design movement. This is essentially a library of open source components. So anybody producing a design, their CAD files, their circuitry, whatever, they can upload it to Thingiverse for anybody to download and make themselves. So it's kind of like an open source library for tangible objects. This is the Copenhagen version, uh, a project started several years back in CVS, free beer. And essentially what they did here was produce a really nice brew and recipe for beer. And they released the brew out to everybody and said, look, you can make it yourselves. Here's the label. All we want you to do is stick this label on it, brew our beer, and you can make it for yourselves. And the nice thing is people did. They developed it into free beer 1.1, 1.2, 2.1, 2.2, 2 2.3. Here's an example of uh, 2.5 in Taiwan. Again, the attribution creative common license they had to adhere to, so they had to give free beer the uh, credit for it. Um, here's free beer 4.0. And the nice thing is because it's share alike, you can take that brewing uh, recipe and you can adapt it, you can put in new ingredients, you can try out different little specialities to the beer. So all of a sudden, this company who just produced one brew online now has an entire product range of lots of different brews of beer. So as we say, it's an emerging paradigm, it's a gift to the people and society, but can you really make money from giving things away for free? Well, this is the question we're asking uh, at the moment in a master's project um, I'm dealing with Aston and Gudrun here. Um, I think there's some business models behind uh, the influence captured from open design. I think when so many people have your design and are using your labels, you can somehow lever some value from it. And that's what we're exploring at the moment. So do people make money from giving things away for free? Well, how big would Google be if it charged per, uh, per search that you did? Nobody pays for Google. Nobody pays per search. We just take it for granted. But they still make a lot of money. But they provide their primary product for free. How successful would Apple be if iTunes wasn't free? And who pays for an internet browser? So certainly in the software domain, very successful companies have made it by giving away their product for free. So can we do it in the, the tangible product domain? 
this is one of the old mindsets we're, we're stuck with in product development. Uh, it's a really nice metaphor of the product developer trying to separate the cost of the product from the sales price. And the further, the stronger the developer's skills are, the further apart these will be and the better the, project, uh, prof, the, better the profit margin. And of course, if, he, if there's not enough distance between the cost and the profit, you get a clamp nipples and you uh, don't make enough profit to sustain your business. So what we need to do is start thinking about the different stakeholders involved and ask the question, which I think is a fundamental open design question, can we provide the product to the customer for free or at a substantially reduced price and try to leave a money or value or revenue from other sources in this supply network? So it's very much about the actors and the stakeholders involved in this system. Now, there is an obvious way of doing it, which is advertising. You get lots of people to use your product for free and you make it back for advertising. And we see that now through Spotify. I can't imagine iTunes are going to make, be making any money from selling content in the future if Spotify carries on the way it is. Uh, hands up who knows Spotify, just out of interest. Okay, so it's, it's essentially iTunes, but all the content is free. Um, and they make their money off uh, people paying for extra premium services on top of it, um, and also advertising. Now, I can't see how iTunes can compete with that anymore. And as long as they get enough uh, market share and they have enough influence, they will be able to leave a value from their system. Now, this is how I've taken some of the, the learnings from PSS and tried to add in the developer's activity cycle. Now, of course, in the PSS model, you have the user, um, the product life cycle and the activity cycle of the customer. In the open design model, we also have to think about the developer as well. What, what does the developer add? And if you think about that in terms of Spotify, they capture value from the developers in the sense that the people are providing playlists for Spotify and they're creating a social network. So part of the business model behind open design is to get users and developers to provide things to add value to your businesses. And then you have to lever extra value from those uh, activities that the users and developers provide. So the be benefits of open design are rapid and cheap publicity, multi-user development and expert customers, increased product varieties, they're competition killers because it's very hard to compete against a company providing uh, your product for free. Um, Suboptimal is forgivable. You have lots of online support services for these types of products. Um, and essentially, if you get it for free, you can get away with it not being quite right. In terms of getting revenue from open design, at the moment, people sell expertise. So the makers of Arduino, RepRap, at the moment, they make most of their money from consultancy services helping provide support for their open designs. You can also produce spin-off products. Straight production is an interesting one. It takes a while to assemble some of these products. Maybe I like the product and I just want to buy one. Where do I go? I go to the originator of the product. So they can actually make a lot of money and gain from this excess advertising they do. Um, um, and also creating value from the new space. So some of the future work that we need to do is look at uh, robust platforms where developers can collaborate on uh, partial products. Rather than uploading complete solutions, they can upload partial solutions and other developers can build on them. The other thing we need to do and we're working on is creating a catalog of archetypal business models which can be used for open design. Um, this is a, a rather nice quote here which I'll let you read from the slides. Um, you can download the slides. We haven't really got time. I want to do an exercise with you in a minute. So uh, check your slides for that quote. But uh, any questions for now? Okay, this is the area I have uh, most of my interest in. So if you've got any, uh, if you want to do any master's projects with me, uh, it'd be in this area. 
Uh, if I can now introduce uh, Asta and Gudrun, who will be pronouncing their own names better than I will, and also introducing uh, the exercise for you to do now. To make it quick, we haven't got much time, but it's a short introduction to the, today's exercise. Now, uh, just skip this one. Just go straight. Yeah, this is the exercise. exercise. So, as Tom's already said, we're working uh, working on a business uh, model strategy for open design, meaning that we're trying to identify these archetypal uh, business models behind those if they exist. Uh, we just started last week, so it's quite new for us. We're all excited. We had this course yet last year, and uh, it was a great, great course. Um, I can say that now because they were great. <laughs> and, uh, He's got a top so grade, by the way, last year. So if you need and, any help. Uh, what I think is really exciting for you guys is that uh, you got like um, a whole new um, task in front of you in, compared to what we had last year. And with this whole open innovation, open design, and crowdsourcing um, ideology, I think you should definitely go for it and try to use it. You will learn a lot from it. I'm sure of that. So in order to uh, teach us something and help us as well in our um, uh, master project and, and, and hopefully help you as well um, in your project, then we have this small exercise. Now, we, it's quite dark. We have, we'll have these papers uh, handed out if you haven't got them already. Uh, and on the back of the page is like this matrix, which is just um, like a, uh, a start for Gurun and I to, to, um, to identify the, the different business models and the different projects that we can, we can work on. Now, if you quickly look at it, um, on, the, uh, on the right axis here with the participation, we've got open and closed, meaning that it could be external or internal, for example, within a company. If you're going to go open, you're going to go out to the crowd. If you're going to, sorry? Can you stop, please? Can you turn off the light? Yeah, if you can. Um, look at the back side. If you can look at the back side of the paper as well, it's written there. <laughs> Otherwise, you will be handed out as well um, a big matrix. <coughs> so that's like the, how the how the participation is in in the, the product development. Now on the bo in the bottom, it's governance. Um, it's either hierarchical or flat. Meaning hierarchical is. There's like a hierarchy, someone takes a decision. Um, in the flat one, it's just open, anyone chooses whatever they want. So just to give you a quick um, tour of the matrix, um, you also uh, earlier the, the, the quirky case, which uh, Tom mentioned, well, it's a bit like the, the, the Kickstarter. It's um, a platform where um, a company or an individual can post um, a problem out to the crowd. Uh, <coughs> which participates uh, in you know, handing out a solution, and then the company that posted it or, or is in charge of the forum takes the decision. So it's a hierarchical, but still open, because the crowd is providing you with the solution. Now if we go to the top right corner, innovation community, uh, which is like Linux open source um, case. So this is like a platform where you have a network where anyone can propose a, a problem or offer a solution, or decide which solution they want to use. So it's completely open. This is what we just heard from Thomas, uh, the, the classical case of this open design, where there's flat, no, no hierarchy, anyone can choose whatever they, they want to use. Now, at the bottom, LE Circle, uh, we have an example of LSE. I'm not sure if you know this. This is like an industrial designer's um, company. They uh, acquire, for example, 200 the most you know, exciting uh, industrial designers in the world and get them to design a product for them. So they have chosen those 200 designers and they get them to, to design a product and then the company chooses, okay, this one we're going to market or, or launch uh, a product this year. So this is like a close and a hierarchical approach. Now the private, the consortium which is closed and flat, uh, we have an example of IBM which um, you know, in cooperation with also bigger companies, uh, worked on a microprocessor, for example, and they made an agreement that they could share the product that they would invent together, but within that uh, consortium. So it's like a, a close design, but still sharing what they're, they're um, inventing. Now, this framework is supposed to uh, help you uh, identify where you could uh, place your business idea, and Guren's going to take over and, ex and explain the exercise. So as Asta said, 
it's sort of um, good for you to have this framework to sort of use to uh, see how your product or your service fits within the open design or open innovation, just wherever you can sort of gain from having open collaboration. Um, does everyone have a seat like this? Every group? Mm -hmm. If you're missing one, then we have more here so you can get it later on. So the idea is that um, before next Friday, you will answer a few questions and you can place the answers on this uh, A3 sheet. We don't want you to go into any specific details to sort of give us an idea about what it is that you're working on and how that would fit within the three or the four different modes. So the first question would be to um, relate the product or service through those modes and sort of tell us how the product uh, development phase or the process is going to be the, the influence. The second one would be to choose the most suitable mode, the thing that you think is going to be best for you, and uh, create a business model um, that suits to that mode. We don't need you to, to do anything, as I said before, specific. This can be just uh, a drawing, a sketch, or you can put it in words. It's up to you. Actually, a very good slide. <laughs> slide 16 from the last presentation over design. It's quite good to illustrate you know, where you're going to capture value. This is nice inspiration. Yeah. And then uh, number three, we would like you to sort of argue for why you want to choose this specific mode. Um, it seems that we have six minutes left, so maybe not the most time in the world. Um, just if you could maybe do it before Friday, and me and Asta, we're going to come and maybe pick your brains a little bit and have a look at your uh, sheet. That's okay with you. So I, uh, I gather some of you still haven't chosen your, your final business model yet, so it might be just worth having a little discussion about the framework and how your different uh, business is fit with it and then have a go at it first thing on Friday and we can come around and collect those sheets in, photocopy them for you and take a scan uh, during the group work on Friday. But for the next five minutes, if you could just familiarise yourself and start thinking about how your current business ideas fit in this framework. Thank you. Maybe one more point. Um, we just want to thank you in advance. We know that it's... Uh you're probably tired and all that stuff, and um, it's just good for us to get some input from you, creative minds and, and so forth. So thank you. We've got our email address in the VM questions or the yeah.